at this time we are preparing for our first session uh, given by Professor Adam McClendon. Let's give him a round of applause, everybody. Yes, 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 of your bulletin, Adam McClendon is the father of four wonderful children. I think he said three girls and one boy. Are they all grown? Not quite. Not quite, <laughs> almost there. And <laughs> not quite, but Lord willing, they will be very soon. And um, four wonderful children, the husband of his dear wife, Adrian. Say hi, Miss Adrian. Hi, Miss Adrian. Yes, he serves as the residential Welcome. associate dean of John Rollins a School of Divinity at Liberty University. He has over 25 years of ministry experience serving in the local church and is also currently a teacher, a uh, teaching elder at Bedrock Community Church in Bedford, Virginia. He is also the founder and director of New Line Ministries, which is a consulting ministry to help encourage and equip leaders in the local church. Among his other publications, he is the author of Square. So we have an author. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Timeless Church and co-editor of Approaching the New Testament, which is an introduction for students of New Testament studies. Adam McClendon received his bachelor's degree in Bible and theology from Southeastern Bible College, his master's degree, and a PhD in biblical spirituality from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you, Professor Adam McClendon. Praise the Lord. Yeah. On, we'll get the volume set here in just a second. Hallelujah. Are we good? Yeah. Yeah. All right. You can hear me? Yeah. yeah. You know, it was funny. I was sitting here today, and I'll give a little introduction here in just a moment. And I thought, you know, it's been a long time since my computer updated. You watch. The enemy is so crafty. Oh, yeah. 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 Right? I'm going to get up there, and it's going to do a mandatory restart. And sure enough, it is. It'll restart and just say, I'm your PowerPoint going. Uh, once you finish updating and doing all these things. But I, I was listening to that beautiful chorus. That God is good all the time. All the time. All the time. All the time. And, and uh, during, the, during this today, I'm going to be doing more of a teaching style. So I'll be having a conversation with you. In the morning, I'll have the privilege of, of preaching. Amen. Which is going to be a little different approach as far as that goes. But... When my first daughter was born, my wife and I had a, a problem getting pregnant, and so we were struggling with that. And God finally, after years of laboring and not knowing who would ever be able to have children, uh, we found out we were expecting, and we were so excited. We have been loving and serving and sacrificing for the Lord, and then that, that day came, and we're all excited, and my wife is in the throes of labor with me. Do this because I'm a dude. I can't do two things at the same time. Ladies, you're way more talented than I am. And uh, that, that time comes where the baby is entering into this world and something's wrong. And the doctors uh, take her very quickly. She's blue. And uh, they look at me and they say, Follow me. And I worked in that hallway. That night, while our baby is fighting for her life, which she's healthy, we'll just sleep with you. Yeah, so just to alleviate that tension. <laughs> I often forget to tell the end of the story when I do share this. And I had no intention of sharing this this morning, but this song reminded me of it. But my wife's laying in the hospital bed, and I'm there beside her and I'm holding her hand, and uh, there were no more tears to be cried. You ever wept to the point where you had no more tears? Yes, yeah. yes. Woo. And I'm thinking theologically through everything, and I'm processing all this, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, God, this doesn't happen. This isn't, this isn't supposed to happen. What's going on? And I thought about the fact that God is sovereign. Like, I'm thinking theologically. How do, how do I understand this? And I thought, God is sovereign. He is, he is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. Like, yes. But here's the thing. God's sovereignty, if God is like Hitler... His power and sovereignty is of no comfort to me because he's evil. That's right, man. That's right. And the question I was really wrestling with is not, is God in control, but is God good? Mm -hmm. As I laid there in bed, I held my wife's hand and I processed all of this. I had to wrestle with the fact, do I really believe that God is good? Not that I have good circumstances. Not that good things happen in my life. That's right. But that God, in and of his character, in and of his very essence, in and of his... His nature that he is 
good and what he does through his redemptive purposes in the midst of a broken and fallen world is good. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because you see, there could be a drug dealer down there on the corner or a, a dude who traffics in human beings and there could be a baby carriage rolling towards a busy intersection and that person could step out and stop that baby carriage and do a good thing, but they are not a good person. person. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. See, God is good in his essence and character and nature. That's right. Amen. And one of the things you do, so again, this is all free. By the way, this isn't even part of the PowerPoint. Like, <laughs> That's awesome. extra, this, this is the tip. There you go. Right. There you go. So, uh, Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Sing to the Lord in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and making melody of the Lord in your heart. Did you know one of the things you do when you sing corporately like that is you are teaching one another. It is corporate teaching. Yes. yes. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but in the fall, in Genesis chapter 3, when mankind ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and sin ushered into our world in history, we see immediately that they look at themselves and realize that they are naked. In other words, their perspective shifted off of others and off of God and onto self, self. Yep. and sin right. and shame sin. and guilt and pride mm -hmm. and anger and self-preservation, all that stuff we struggle with every day, mm -hmm. right? When you look at a photograph, what determines whether that's a good picture of your family or not? How you look in the picture, right? <laughs> right? Don't take that selfie on there, dinner, and, and your wife goes, that's not a good picture of your wife. She's look at me. I got the camera high enough. I got a double chin there, right? You got to lift it up. <laughs> what, what, what caused that? The fall, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. But when we see what happens in the church, when we gather, our perspective shifts off of ourselves and onto making melody to teach one another and to praise the Lord. Amen. It is a return to our intention and our created order where now for a moment, for, for just a glimpse, for for just five minutes, that's just a long nap, wasn't it? But it felt, it was fast, man. It felt good. <laughs> Our focus shouldn't be on us. That's right. That's true. And it's a glimpse of the glory and the community that we are going to have at the end of the age. When all that junk's removed and we get to worship him yeah. in community yes. forever. Yeah. So Amen. I go on and on, but I'm going to get this part of yeah. do this I mean, that way y'all don't have to see everything I'm doing <laughs> yes. I got a recruiter in the back of the room. <laughs> Check my time, make sure we're good. We are good. All right, let me introduce my family to you. This is my precious bride, Adrian. I'm privileged to be able to be married yes. to her for, we're going on 27 years. Woo! So this picture was taken a few months ago, let's say a year ago, whatever, I don't remember how long ago. Last summer, I think, maybe, I'm whatever. But uh, that's my oldest daughter. I'm horrible with time. If I say the other day, it could have been two days ago or 15 years ago. I just, so time and geography are not my strength. So I have a very narrow area of expertise. Uh, so Madeline, she, oh my goodness, this silly thing. I tell you, the enemy is good. But God is better. All right. Yeah. Uh, so Madeline is now engaged. She's getting married in December. Just like she was the one who we didn't know if she was going to live or die. God was a very gracious spirit in her life. She's healthy. She graduates to Liberty University with a degree in biblical studies. So she's doing Greek over the summer, her third Greek semester. So she can study the New Testament. It's the original language. Uh, her fiance wants to do church planting in Manchester, England. He has a passion for overseas ministry. Uh, my son Cameron's our youngest, so I'll get to him in a minute. But let me jump to the other end. That's Megan. She's our second oldest daughter, but not our second tallest daughter. Uh, <laughs> she is. She's going into her senior year of high school. Her, all of our kids play soccer. They've been very active in soccer for years. 
uh, Megan wants to do sports administration, sports communication, sports marketing. She's not sure, but she loves, she's a sports nut. And being a woman, she's underestimated all the time. So when she uh, kills the guys in sports trivia, they are in all of her. Mary Grace is the next one. She loves doing hair and beauty and all things uh, girly. And so she actually, though, is struggling what God's calling on her life is. She is going into her junior year. She is considering studying global studies or missions at Liberty University. She really feels a call to East Africa. She doesn't know why we've never been there. I've been there. But she's never been there, but there's something in her heart. And I keep asking her, what is it? She goes, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what God's doing, but I just have this longing for this area. And so pray for her as God continues to bring clarity to what he's doing. And then my son, Cameron, he is 15, going on 51. <laughs> and he's about 6'2", about 155 pounds. He's been working out. He started playing football some. He didn't know. Uh, by the way, the ladies are a little aggressive in today's society, so pray for him. He's <laughs> <laughs> He'll have girls walk up to him and take his phone and put their number in his phone. He's like, whoa, <laughs> like, what's going on? So God is <laughs> God is doing something in his life, and we're praying for his protection, right? He's growing up in a very That's vile, right. yeah. corrupt world. Yes, it is. So as you think about me, pray for our family in that regard. He's praying about God's calling his life. He, he, I, I work very hard to allow our children to own their faith. Yes. So about five years ago, I was up in his room and he said, Dad, it's bedtime and he said, so who made God? <laughs> so we started talking about the eternality of God, no beginning, no end. And I started sharing this idea of, well, if something created God, whatever created him would be the creator. Therefore, that would be God. Like whatever was the first, the beginning, mm -hmm. That is God. See, if you're a secularist, if you're depending on your view of evolution, then, then you're, it might be materialism, right? That's your God. Everybody has a God, something that, that pre existed everything else that drives everything. And so we're talking about this, and he goes, I just don't know I can buy this stuff. Oh, I says, okay. I can't, I can't give it to you, man. You got to own this and you got to wrestle with who God is based on his word right. and whether you're going to choose to follow him. But as for me, I've made my decision, buddy, but I'll pray for you. You got to own this man. So I knelt by his little head and I held his hands and we prayed. And I said, man, I believe God is good. If you will seek him, I believe you will find him. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Amen. Amen. So the other day, so fast forward now five years, the other day I'm sitting in my bedroom and I'm working. He comes back home from Wednesday night service with the youth. And he goes, can we talk for a minute? I said, absolutely. He said, how do I know if God's leading me in full-time ministry? Hallelujah. Wow. Jesus. And I said, well, so it's tempting for me to want to push you in that direction because that's my passion. Yeah. I said, first off, you need to understand no matter what you do, you're a full time minister. We'll talk about that more later. That's By right. the way, you're full time ministers. That's right. If you're that's right. in Jesus, that's right. we'll, we'll talk more about that. But I said, what you're talking about is it's called vocational ministry. In other words, by the way, I'm. This is all free stuff. Look at this man. I, I'm over delivering. Maybe you got to bring me back. Uh, we got started. So, the word occupation from its Greek or not Greek, but Latin roots and everything. It basically means job. Some might do. Yeah. Vocation, voco, vocal. Vocal. We don't use the word vocation in our culture anymore. The original root word of vocation means a calling. I don't know if y'all knew that. Yeah. No. That's why we call it vocational ministry, meaning I am called by God to commit all of my life to this full-time ministry. And so I said, what you're wrestling with is whether God's calling you to vocational ministry. So we're going to work through that. I said, I share with some tips of things that, that help you make that determination. I said, for example, is this my desire? First Timothy 3, 1, those who desire the office of elder desire a good thing or overseer, right? Is there, a, is there a burning desire that's unquenchable in you? I talked about the fact I said is, is uh, you know, are, is there a giftedness there? Are there certain skill sets that you see? And I actually alliterated with a bunch of P's at the time. I won't bore you with that. I have a tendency to do that sometimes. So, but I asked, I said, do other people see this in you? Is this affirmed by the community? Does the church look at you and go, yeah, we see, we see something in you. So all of these things, is, is God opening up opportunities? But I said, here's what I want you to do. And so I, I had him schedule 
to speak with another minister who could help guide him this so that I wouldn't influence him too much as dad. Right. So he's processing that right now. That's our family. To let you know we have two dogs who they don't have pictures of up there, but that tells you a little about us. So a little bit more about our family. Adrian and I, when we first got married, I was we were married four and a half months, and I was sent overseas to Japan for a year in the military unaccompanied so she had to stay behind so four and a half months into our marriage we're separated for a year that's hard it is yeah, that's hard if you've been there that's hard come back we're i don't have a job i'm looking for employment I'm working at a church i'm making 500 dollars a month at a church i'm the children's youth and associate pastor and not not making a lot of money but doing a lot of work and so we didn't have a whole lot of money so we had to live in an area of town that was reflective of that now mm-hmm. some david about um door-to-door drug salesman coming door to door saying and there's this guy who showed up at our door one day and he was as big as the door he was huge i just got in the marine corps so i was just hearing big guys and, and he was a big dude and i opened the door and i was like this guy gonna kill me and uh, he goes you want some scripts? I said, excuse me? He goes, do you want some scripts? And he opens his jacket and he's got a pharmacy. That's to see, I mean, he's door to door drug selling. I said, no, but I, I got something for you. He goes, what's that? I go, man, I'd love to tell you about Jesus. And I start witnessing to him right there on the front step and we start talking, but that's the area Adrian and I lived in when we first got married and God has since continued to grow our family and bless us. And now I have the privilege of being the associate dean at Liberty Amen. University. Hallelujah. Adrian and I were driving, I think, by campus or something like that, and I just told her, I said, I, I'm in awe that I get to work at this place. God's doing some great things yes. on that campus. But I want to get to what we're talking about today, which you know, never. Let's see what's going on here. There we go. All right. The plan. Let's talk about plan. All right. What is our purpose as Christians? Why are we here? Let's talk about this a little bit. So this is, you, you get some feedback here. What's your purpose as a Christian? Tell me some things David has taught. This is what we're going to test Uh-oh. the waters right now. We're going to see what kind of teaching you've been getting. So, <laughs> so what's your purpose? Great commission. Great commission. Making a disciple and making disciples. Okay. Any other terms you've heard? Okay. I've heard love God, love others, glorify God and enjoy Him, make disciples, the Great Commission, all this type of stuff. The Bible gives us glimpses of these purposes, and, and there it, really there's one big purpose, but it's just kind of packaged a little different in different times and different places. <laughs> About being ambassadors, like we've heard that. We can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21 there. And see this idea that you're called to be an ambassador. All these different glimpses of interwovenness that really communicate to us the purpose of God. Unfortunately, though, what we've done is we've taken most of those purposes and we package them and we place them upon the bishop. That's, that's who he is. That's what he's supposed to do. But my purpose is to make money for my family. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Right? My purpose is to dot, dot, dot. My purpose is to enjoy life. My purpose is to binge watch my favorite show on Netflix for the next five days. Right? My purpose is to make sure I satisfy this fleshly body. And so what we do is we take our spiritual purposes and we package them. And if I use a spiritual word, incarnate them into our spiritual leadership and we give ourselves a pass. And here's one reason why I think we do that. So by general practitioner versus a specialist. So we'll just use the idea of foot pain. I don't know if anybody's ever struggled with foot pain. I got a friend here, he struggles with gout. And so you, you got these foot issues, and you go to the doctor and you say, Doctor, my foot's hurting. And the doctor's gonna go, hmm. What's happening? Well, it hurts. When does it hurt? When I walk. Okay. He'll touch it for a minute and they'll go, well, let's get an x-ray. He'll get an x-ray, and they say, I don't see a fracture. I'll tell you what, I need to refer you to a podiatrist. See, in our culture, we've become so specialized, we've lost the idea of a general practitioner. I, I remember I was I was in a I was teaching a Sunday school class for a while. 
I was privileged to teach this class. It was a pretty large class, and I'm big on raising up leadership. So we always have three to four people always teaching in the class. So I would teach a week. I'm big on team teaching. We can't disciple people if we never give them an opportunity to fail. Yeah. And so what I would do is I sit down with people and I say, hey, you know, I see some giftedness in your life. Would you be willing to teach? Tio, I want you to teach in three weeks. This week, here's the passage. I want you to come to the outline. I want you to come to the point of the passage first. And I want you to run that by me. And I'll tell you if that's if we're all on point or not. Then the next week, I want you to come with an outline. And then the week you're supposed to be teaching, I want you to work on your illustrations and actually how you're going to teach this to the class. Say, okay. So we'd have a three-week process for every person that taught <coughs> until like they got good at it, and then I would let them go. And they would just they would just be in a cycle of teaching. So there was this guy, he was a general manager, oversaw, I don't know how many millions of dollars he oversaw and how many other stores, but he was a very successful business person. Incredibly articulate, attractive, healthy, ran triathlons. And one day I approached him and I said, hey, you, man, when you speak, everybody in the class just kind of, hmm, they listen, right? That, it's insightful, it's good, I, I really see something. And here's what he told me without missing a beat. He goes, I can't. And I go, why? He goes, I've never been trained. Mm, that's right. I've never gone to school. I'm not smart enough. That's not my area of expertise. And I went, you're a child of God. You got the spirit of the living God in you. What are you telling me? <laughs> to this day, he doesn't teach. He feels inadequate because he bought into this lie that if he didn't have the right degrees, the right pedigree, the right background, the right training, the right job, then he is not competent and capable to do this over here. Here's the reality that we have to get to. God has called you to be a disciple maker. Men, woman, boy, girl, that matter. If you are a child of the king, you're called to be a disciple maker. God has placed you in a particular community. Here's what I noticed about my community. I live now, right or wrong, good or bad, in a very affluent community. I'm unbelievably blessed in where I get to live. <laughs> I'm not going to have a relationship with these people in these apartments over here the way some of you will be able to have a relationship with those people in those apartments over there. There are neighbors. There are family members. There are people in this congregation that God has placed you here with a specific purpose in mind. You have a particular family. You're like, I'll trade. <laughs> no, no, I'm good. I'm good. I've got my own problems. I promise you. <laughs> God has placed you in a particular workplace. Yeah. God has placed you in a particular school. God has placed you in a particular church. And he's done all this so that you can reach a particular people. Amen. Amen. Obviously, the passage to make disciples by making Jesus known. This is our mission. We can word it in a bunch of different ways. I remember the last church where I had the privilege of serving as the senior pastor. It was in Missouri. And I got there and they had this really complicated mission statement. I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to simplify this. Our mission hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Our job is to make disciples by making Jesus known. That's, what we're, that's, all, that's, that's, our, that's all we're going to talk about. Matthew 28, 19, and 20, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there's more to it that we'll get to in a minute, which is what? What's the other part of it? Anybody know? Well, baptizing them, and then the second part, verse 20, and teaching them. That's right. And we'll talk about what's involved in disciple making in a minute. But let's look at this. Anybody heard of Dave Carnes? Heard of 9 11, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, we heard of that. I was serving at a church and the director of the missions at a Bible college. When 9-11 happened, I'd just been out of the Marine Corps for four years. So when you go in the military, you commit to an eight-year, whether you realize this or not, you're committing to eight years. They, they can recall you at any time within an eight-year window, although you have a contract for a certain obligated time, you have this unobligated time or inactive reserves where they can recall you. I didn't know that at the time. But I served my four years. I actually loved it, would have stayed in. I was very blessed. God helped me get promoted very quickly. I was an E5, so I was a sergeant in the Marine Corps. And I get out, and I go to Bible college because I feel God prompting me to full-time vocational ministry. And then I finished my Bible college, 
So I just finished eight years that May. The college I went to brought me on staff full time. They, they saw something that I was privileged to be able to come on. So I came on full time staff with them. And I just got my certificate in the mail saying that I was done with my service in 9 11 happens. I remember watching the TV. And, and I remember going to my wife and wrestling with the fact should we go back in? Like, should we re enlist? Like, what do we do here? But in the wake of 9 11, I just finished listening to a book. It's an audible book called The Only Plane in the Sky. And what they do is they do an oral history where they take clips actually of people talking, of interviews. There's all kinds of politicians. There's uh, EMT specialists. There's pilots. There's even the voice of the terrorist. And they put it together in a chronological story where you have people's own testimonies telling the story of what happened with very little editorial in between. But Dave Carnes, what happened right after 9 11 happens? The buildings, they didn't know the buildings were going to fall. The buildings ended up falling, and there's people trapped. They don't know what to do. I mean, nobody's ever faced anything like this in our country. Dave Carnes is working in an office. He's out, he's retired out of the military, former Marine, just gotten out. He, he goes in his office one day and he goes, I've got to do something. We're under attack. There's a battle. I've got to do something. So he goes home. He goes, I'm out. I'm going to help. And they go, what are you going to do? He goes, I don't know. But I've got to do something. He goes home. He gets his fatigues. And he drives to ground zero at dear 9-11. Because of his uniform, he gets through all the checkpoints. He ends up walking right in. They are pulling everyone off the pile because it's too dangerous. And he walks. Walks right onto the pile. And he starts screaming. If you can hear me, please scream or tap. And he's just screaming this. And he pulls the last two survivors out of the rubble from 9-11 because David Carnes, an unlikely hero, said there is something that must be done and I will do it. Reminds me of Isaiah 6-8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for me? And then said, I hear my send me. So Matthew 28 18. We know 19 and 20 really well, but look at 28, 18. Look what it says. Somebody go ahead and read this for us. Really, that's on the screen, so you can use your Bibles or you can follow along in your Bible. You can use your Bibles or follow on the screen. But somebody read this from the screen for me really loud. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has given has been given to me. Okay, what is Jesus doing here? Okay. David talks about it in his prayer. He is establishing. I am the messianic king from the Old Testament. Here's our problem. As Westerners, we don't come from a Jewish ancient Near East background. All these first century Jews, they knew the Old Testament really well. And they knew the Old Testament was beckoning to this messianic king who was going to come and right all injustices. He was going to establish and inaugurate the kingdom of God. He would crush the head of the serpent, though he would be bruised on his heel. And he would establish his kingdom, a kingdom that lived and functioned under the authority of God. When Jesus is casting out demons, one of the things he's doing is he's showing his kingdom authority. Right? All authority has been given to me. That's why the disciples are in awe of him. Like even the wind and the rain obeys him. All these moments are showing he is that messianic king who is to come. Mm -hmm. So before Jesus gives this great commissioning, and by the way, you go, his authority has been established, but it will not be fully experienced until the end of the age. Mm -hmm. That's why the Bible begins with, by the way, a kingdom. We call it a garden. It's a kingdom. Mm -hmm. It's a temple. temple. It's the, the, the presence of God, and it ends with what? A kingdom, kingdom and a temple where God is on a throne and there's a river of life flowing from it and we are all dwelling in the city of God. That's why the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham looked forward to a city on a hill and though he did not get to experience the city in his lifetime, he never quit pursuing it. Amen. What is that city on the hill? It is the kingdom of God where he is reigning in all of his goodness and all of his glory. It is the fullness of the promises of God. And Jesus is on the scene here right into Matthew saying, I'm that guy. And all authority has been given to me. And so what I'm about to say, I don't say as a suggestion, I say as a command. Amen. So that was where we come to Matthew 20, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples. By the way, 
we think the command by in this passage is often to go. But the word go there in the original Greek language. So the New Testament is written in something called Koine Greek. The word go is actually not a command there in the passage. The command is make disciples. Here's a, another translation of how you could translate it. As you are going. In other words, when we think of this passage, we think about going on a mission trip. Go somewhere and make a disciple. No, no, the passage is literally saying, as you are going, make disciples of all nations. In other words, wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, in whatever place of life you are in, your job is to make disciples. It is a command. Mm-hmm. Something else, though. It's a constant command. Mm-hmm. And this isn't like, I have a season of life where I'm disciple making and then we'll take a break. So for those of us in retirement. Uh-oh. No, I ain't no retirement. <laughs> That's right. I ain't not. I have friends, and all they talk about is, man, I wonder if one day I can retire. So you can do what? So I can just take it easy. And uh, let me be clear. There's nothing wrong with rest. God gave Sabbath for a reason. That's right. That's In fact, right. I get concerned about uh, David sometimes going, man, this guy's burning at both ends, right? I mean, he goes hard. The Sabbath is good. It is. But we never unplug from God's commands, do we? No, no. no. Notice it's a consuming command. Mm-hmm. This consumes every aspect of my life. Mm-hmm. I, I like playing an old card game. There's an old card game called Trump. I uh, called Rook. And you have a Trump card in in Rook, <laughs> right? Those Trump cards. And so this trumps everything in your life. It is the king. It's the Rook card. I don't know if any of you ever played that that game before. It's the consuming command. It is the preeminent thing over all that I do. Which, by the way, if I'm going to be making disciples, that implies I'm going to be a disciple, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. right. (laughs) This is where I think we messed up the gospel a little bit. I met with a gentleman that I care about very deeply the other day. It was a couple years ago. Again, I told you the other day could be a couple days or or several years. That's about two years ago. (laughs) <laughs> and my heart was hurting for this individual. And so uh, they were struggling with some different things. Anyway, I got on a plane, actually flew to spend a couple days with them. And while we're in there and we're barbecuing something on the back grill, it's just me and him. He does, he's not married and have any kids. And we're talking. And he says something. He goes, well, I believe in God. And I, just, I stopped right there. And I said, no, you don't. He goes, what do you mean? And I started laughing at him. I said, there's not an aspect of your life that demonstrates you believe in God. <laughs> Told the truth. I said, let me tell you what, what being a Christian is. It means that I am following Jesus. What did Jesus say? Come and, Come and follow, follow me. me. Yeah. You don't believe in Jesus if you're not following Jesus. Amen. 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 Right? I mean, it's just that's just the bottom line. That's not, and so I just started talking about that. Then the gospel is when I realize that I am on a path of death and destruction, and I give it all up to experience the life right. that is in him. And by the way, we're always a servant of someone. Yes. 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 So the Bible says I'm either a slave to this world, to my desires, to death and destruction, or I'm a slave to righteousness, to, to God. Nowhere does it say I'm free to my own autonomy. And so, so, so the gospel message is for you to die to yourself so that you can experience real life. That he says, you give up your life and I'm going to give you a life far greater than you could ever imagine. And he's looking at me and I said, that sounds crazy. Dad. And he goes, this is a dude who grew up in a Christian school. And he goes, you sound nuts. Mm. And I said, because it is. And I invite you on the ride. That's yes. right. Hallelujah. Yeah. And he still hasn't accepted Jesus, but, but I just told him, this isn't an easy, it's, it's easy to do, but it involves great sacrifice. Mm-hmm. For the rewards are far deserved. This is a, this hangs on, this is my wall in my office. And look, I'll talk about my office a little bit tomorrow morning. I'm going to mention at the very end about this uh, glass. So uh, you come in the door, and if you came in my door and take an immediate right, there's my desk right there in shape of an L. And right over my desk is this. And then as you come in the door, if you went straight, if you didn't take an immediate right, if you look straight, about it's not a very big office, it's just a beautiful office. There's a big, the whole wall's glass. I get to look out over the campus. 
But this is what I remind myself of every day. Amen. This is what we do. And it's a little redundant, but it's a comprehensive command. Amen. So let's go on. So what does disciple making entail? So here's what it entails. First off, it entails bringing people to faith in Christ. We tend to think about two aspects of the Christian life. We think about evangelism and discipleship as if they're opposite sides of a coin. Right? I evangelize and then I disciple. And so what we've done is we made discipleship the where I sit down and do a study with somebody and help them get, get grow deeper in the faith. That's not how the Bible presents discipleship. Discipleship is the umbrella command or mission that involves us evangelizing and maturing people. I'll talk about this other component in a minute, but we're going to start with the evangelizing. Does anybody know what the word evangel means or evangelize? There's another word for gospel. What's that word? Does anybody know that's here in the New Testament? It's called the gospel or good news. To evangelize means to share good news. What is the good news that we share? The king is here. Jesus has come. That Messiah, long awaited one, who's going to establish the rule and reign of God, came and he conquered death and hell. And through him, you can be reconciled with God and you can enjoy him forever in a kingdom. Hey, you, you want to get rid of the racial injustice in our world? Guess what? King Jesus is going to make it right again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You Hallelujah. want to get rid of all the all the death and destruction and hatred and all the injustices happening? You want to get rid of the wars and the rumors of wars? Guess what? King Jesus is going to make it happen. I believe we have a world that wants the same thing we do. They just don't understand Jesus is the solution. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're putting their hopes in political leaders mm -hmm. and systems and structures and Planned Parenthood and all these other organizations that are going to fix all the problems of their society. And they don't, guess what? Every one of them simply perpetuates the problems of our society. Yeah. Yeah. This world isn't our home. No. It doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to make it better. We just don't put our hope in it. Yeah. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. But let me share with you a little bit about bringing people to faith in Christ. Because does this text say evangelize? What does the text say? What's the underlying word there? Baptize. Because this is where it gets confusing here. So let's explain in the in the early church. I have a Facebook post. If you're on Facebook, I have a Facebook post where a friend of mine who's a church historian, he studies the first century or called the patristics, the church fathers. He studies the church fathers. He's one of the leading scholars in the world on the church fathers. And he made a post and I, I, I copied it and posted it on my Facebook page. Baptism in the early church was the moment where one publicly identified with the wretchedness, wretchedness of their sin and the righteousness of Jesus. In the early church, that was the moment you were identified. I'm not saying spiritually what had happened to you, but that was the moment as a community you were identified as part of the body of Jesus. And you were not considered part of the body of Jesus at that point because that was the point where you had to publicly identify with the people of God and with Christ in such a way that it might cost you everything. Yes. Your families would disown you. The Roman government would get suspicious of you. Like it could literally cost you your life in the first century. And so baptism was that sign of dying to self and rising to new life in Christ that was part of their church that was inevitably connected with your testimony so that you were not considered a Christian in the early church without it. Mm -hmm. right. Because that was the line of debarkation where you said, this is my faith and I will follow him. Mm -hmm. And you publicly demonstrated that. Mm -hmm. So the New Testament in telling us to baptize people is saying, create converts, bring them to faith in Jesus. Evangelize. So I'm going to share with you a simple system. I don't know what, what training mechanism you all have for sharing your faith. I want to share with you what I design and what I use when I share my faith. Because it's easy. Again, I like alliterating. It's easy for me to remember. It's four Ps. So I still are out there so you could, if you want to write it down or copy it down. Sometimes some of you struggle with how do I share the gospel. Now again, the gospel is deep. It is rich. There's many components to it. But this is just one elementary introductory step into the gospel. So what is it? Number one, it's God's perfection. Here's why. I was raised 
in an independent fundamental Baptist church where it was hell fire. Anybody raised in a hell fire and brimstone church? Yeah. Where they would scare the hell out of you, literally. Like it was like, dude. I, hey, they had me so scared of hell, I would run to anything. <laughs> you get a cult coming in, I'll be a part of that. If it means I don't burn in wretched fire forever, absolutely. I'll take whatever you got. I mean, I remember them telling me stories about worms. I mean, I, it, got, it got rich up in that point. Now, now, I'm not saying hell's not real. It is. The Bible talks about it. But the gospel isn't about running from hell. The gospel is about running to someone. Jesus. The only reason hell is brought up is just letting us know there is a judgment. And primarily, Jesus brings up hell not to scare people, but to say, you know those people you think are righteous? Yeah. Guess what? They're headed towards destruction. And they're going, to be, they're going to be held accountable for what they're doing to you. So don't fret. It's usually not used in a sense, read, read the Gospels. It's usually not used in a sense of terrifying people. It's used to bring them comfort that there are consequences to others. Mm -hmm. But think about this. We don't run from something, we're running to someone. Mm -hmm. Leviticus 19.2 is also quoted in 1 Peter 1.16. And it says, be holy, for I am the Lord your God. We have a holy God. We don't have this God made in our image. We don't have a God who is, who is faulty like our political leaders. We have a God who is holy. And he has holy intentions for us. But that poses a problem. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here's the reality. If God is holy and I'm sinful... God in his holiness will not stand in a right disposition towards sin. He, he won't stand in a right relationship to that which is not holy right. because otherwise it would defile him. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So in his holiness and in his justice, he condemns sin. The problem is we are sinners. Mm -hmm. And that's where Romans 6.23 and Romans 5.8 comes in. Romans 5.8. Is God's provision. God made provision yeah. for that sin for us because we couldn't. But I, I, I'm, a, I'm a sinner. I can't make provision for myself, but God in his mercy makes provision for us, right? Mm -hmm. God demonstrated his love towards us, Romans 5 8 says, and that while we were mm -hmm. still sinners, sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. Yeah. Romans 6 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free yeah. gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I can be reconciled to a loving and gracious and good Father. Now, here's the problem. A lot of us won't stop there. But if God has died for sins, and there's no more condemnation in Christ, then the implication, if we're not careful, is that everybody goes to heaven because Jesus has died for everyone. But the Bible has a promise attached to this. That's right. John 1 12 says to the many as received him to me as believed in his name to them he gave the right to become children of God that's right them John 3 16 famous verse what does it say God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son yes so whoever should believe in him shall be saved whoever believes in him believe that's it believes so, so there's a point of debarkation where I have to choose to, choose to believe in him to, to follow him mm -hmm. I have an illustration I use a lot of times and I'll, I'll do it real quick. So this is my bag. It's just a bag. But let's pretend like it's a parachute. I, I, should have, I should have shown them this video. By the way, you'll get a kick out of this. I got a couple years ago because of my position. When, when you get into certain positions of influence, I didn't realize this, but you get perks other people just don't get. That's right. Like, it's just cool. <laughs> I got invited to go parachuting with the Golden Knights at Fort Bragg. Wow. Yeah. Right. Wow. So it's on YouTube. You don't realize how much extra skin you have on your face till you jump out of an airplane. The sides of your face, you're like, oh my goodness. But let's say, let's say this is a parachute, for example. I can walk in and I can see a parachute sitting there and go, huh? That's a parachute. I can acknowledge that's a parachute. Just like I can acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. I can even believe, you know what, I bet if you put that parachute on and you went up in a plane and you jumped, I bet it's, I bet it'd work. I mean, the demons believe in shudder, right? I, I, I can believe that. Yep. That's worlds apart 
when you're up in a plane, if I ever parachuted and you strap a parachute back and you're about to jump out of the plane, you're going. <laughs> you got to have enough faith that this is going to work to jump out. Yeah. And you're jumping out saying, if this don't work, I got no other hope. <laughs> I'm put. I'm going all in. If you got any car players in here, I put all my chips on the table. I'm pushing them in. Texas home, right? I'm all in because I believe that Jesus saves and He reconciles and He will make me right with the Father and He's going to renew and restore all things at the end of the age. And He is my hope. Amen. He's my parachute. Yes. 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 Right, so, so that's the message of hope that we're taking to view, that he's establishing his kingdom, that Jesus is the son who inaugurates the kingdom and is inviting us into a right relationship with him that we will experience at the end of the age. And so what we're doing is we're bringing people to faith in Christ, but we're also helping people mature in Christ. So if every one of us, let's go back to that practitioner versus specialization, if everyone's called to make disciples, you are called both to evangelize and mature people. We are people that walk with the gospel on our lips and the gospel in our lives. But it's not just a gospel that God is, has offered salvation to you, but that God also wants to grow you up in that salvation. St. Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we are commanded, so here's a, here's a participatory question. If we are commanded to teach them, as people, everything Jesus has commanded us, what should we be teaching? What are some ideas or concepts? Now, I don't have any list in mind, so I just want to know. Like, if you're going to teach someone, what are some things that you would need to teach them? Gospel. Okay, the gospel, what else? The commandments. What else? Ordinance. Okay, ordinances. How to that we fall short and need a savior. savior. How to make another disciple. How to make another disciple. Yeah. What, our, what is our hope in? What is our hope in? Yeah. What is our hope in? Yeah. The law. Basis of forgiveness. How to fight against spiritual warfare. How to fight against spiritual warfare. I just did a, I did a session on spiritual warfare um, for the RA. We have these things called resident assistants. Mm -hmm. They asked me to teach on spiritual warfare, and I was talking about the battlefield of the mind. mind. Yes, yes, yes. And, and they were like, yeah. no one had ever said it. Just walked them through scripture saying, what does the Bible say about the mind and how That's we right. fight the mind? Right. 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 What else? Right. Worship. 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 Prayer. Yeah. Prayer. Yeah. Prayer. Yeah. I remember, so by the way, those of you who are musically talented, <laughs> I am not. And I remember going to a camp one time. And the guy goes, I'm going to teach you the fruit of the Spirit. And he did a little song. <laughs> And that little song, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And all you do is have those words, and you put them to a tune. Mm -hmm. You're going, I, I can't sing, so I won't do them all. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I love to sing. Same, man. I sing so poorly. No, 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 no. You know, I've been uninvited from a choir before. <laughs> <laughs> but I, they begged me to join the choir. <laughs> and they said, we need, we need some guys in the choir, please. I go, y'all on the channel singing. They go, please, please. So I was in the choir. I went to one practice, and the choir came to me after and go, um, I think it'd be best if you were not. <laughs> <laughs> One day, we were early on in marriage. I don't know if my wife remembers this, but uh, I love to sing, and I'm in the shower, and I'm just going to town. Oh, boy, like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, my wife comes in, and just she she just she was at the end of her rope. She was, Will you please just shut up? I cannot handle what you're singing anymore. <laughs> So I think, I'm so bad that I'm not even allowed to sing in the shower. <laughs> but I just remember that little ditty that they did. And it was just love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. Um, I'm sorry, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. And it was just, and just to this day, it's stuck in my head. So. We teach people about the attributes of God, the seriousness of sin, the deity of Jesus, the necessity of disciple making, how to walk in holiness and obedience, how to live a life out of love. Like, yeah. There's an endless reservoir mm -hmm. of what we teach because the word of God is rich yeah. and it's living yeah. and it's active and it's a two-edged sword that divides to the very deepest intentions of our hearts. Amen. Amen. First Timothy 1 talks about teaching them to avoid false and fruitless yeah. teachings. Yeah. We're teaching that Christ has expectations for our life, that Jesus wants us to love God and love others, and there are various expressions that he's given to us on how we can do that. 
just a never-ending process of things that we're teaching. I'm getting ready to start a class, spring of 2023. I'm working on developing it right now. Boy, for one hour and 15 minute lecture for this class, it takes me four to 10 hours to develop one hour and 15 minute lecture for students. I've been doing this a long time. And I'm doing one of the foundations of the Christian life, the gospel and its implications, how to grow spiritually, how to leverage spiritual disciplines in the end, the purpose of spiritual disciplines throughout the scripture, of how God designed Bible intake and prayer to work. And why don't we have more answered prayers? I have an acronym that I teach them, A-N-S-W-E-R. That for answered prayer is to be asked. It's not for show. It's scriptural. It's worshipful. It's earnest. And it's out of a righteous life. Righteous life. So we talk about how to have answered prayer, how to have confidence in our prayer life. And I'm going to teach them and go through scripture. We're going to talk about fasting and what is the spiritual discipline of fasting and and it's not just something we do to earn the favor of God, but it's us coming and saying, God, just I need you more than I need the most basic necessities yeah. of life. It is yeah. us, it is us yeah. teaching that we can bring our desires under the submission of our will. Mm-hmm. That I don't have to give in to my desire. Right? Galatians 5.16, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. I have to choose to suppress my desires to bring them into conformity to the will of the Spirit. This is why you are more than your sexual desires. That's right. You're more than your sexual identity. That's right. I can say no to what I feel and even who I believe I biologically am yes, in order to bring that into submission to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yeah. Because he is Lord of all. Of all. all of them. But as we teach these things, here's what I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. We're going to go a little deep for a second, okay? We're going to step out of the we're going to step out of the shallow end and we're going to tread water a little bit. But we, we need to categorize what we teach people and be careful because all teachings are not equal. Mm-hmm. All not. doctrines are not equal, meaning some doctrines are more important than others. Yeah. For example, I know people that overemphasize speaking in tongues. I know people who underemphasize it. I know people who overemphasize other things that are important but not critical. So... Here's a good way of thinking. A lot of people do this on a dartboard. I've seen it with like an iceberg illustration or a cone. But basically you have three different categories. I want to encourage you to keep things in mind. And that's primary, secondary, and tertiary. I think tertiary is the dumbest word on the planet. It's so weird. It just means third. It's the way of saying secondary, but it's the third category. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't even know that was a word. So uh, primary, secondary, and, and tertiary. So it would be things like this. The deity of Jesus. That's primary. That's primary, primary, right? The gospel. Mm -hmm. The Trinity. Mm -hmm. Right? These fundamental doctrines that if we salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, the exclusivity of Jesus. These are things that if we disagree here, I don't know that I can treat you like a brother and sister in Christ because we're fundamental. This is my problem, by the way, and I, I, I do apologize for this. But with some of my Mormon or Jehovah's Witness friends, That's we're right. not on the same page here. Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. be friends with you, but we can't fellowship as believers because we have a different gospel. That's right. Like we're, we're, we're a little divided here. We got a lot in common. There's a lot of overlap. That's right. But on some of these primary issues, we're not on the same page. No, it, that affects it. Now, I can worship, though. I can call you Brother Sister Christ and even go to the same church and disagree on some of these issues. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Second that. Second that. There's secondary issues. And so there's a variety of secondary issues that are out there that, I, you know, I'll give you an example of a secondary issue. For me, it's a mode of baptism. Is it sprinkling or immersion? Yeah. You know what? I, I, you know, to me, I think the Bible speaks to that, and I have a very solid opinion about that. I, I hold to immersion for a reason. Me too. I hold to believer's baptism for a reason. But you know what? I have many God people that love Jesus. We just disagree on that. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. We're going to find out at the end of the age. And I'm <laughs> going right. to do my best to convince them they're wrong. Yeah. And they're going to do my best to convince me I'm wrong. That's okay. Yeah. And then you have tertiary or third category. So, for example, like uh, how and when is Jesus going to come back? There's different views. Amillennialism, postmillennialism, premillennialism, like Pre- all these views that are important. That it's good to study those things and disciple people. But you know what? If somebody first comes to faith in Jesus, I'm not going to start up here. No. No. I'm going to start down here. Yeah. Yeah. And so I want to encourage you that as you are reaching out to people, but also, here's my other thing. Don't stop here. Yeah. 
No. I know people go, oh, you just get saved, you just love Jesus, and you're okay. No. Well, no. <laughs> true, but uh, there's a lot more of disciplining your body to what it means to have a daily time with the Lord and how to enjoy Him daily and how to how to wake up and, and discipline the mind to, to rest and walk with Him in the midst of an evil age. Because you have a world that is doing everything it can to undermine and destroy your faith. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I want to move on. I can talk. We can talk about this all day. But this is just a way of thinking about discipleship, right? Yeah. We just want to get these ingrained in our brain. That first, the, God's plan is that you are a disciple maker. Amen. Yeah. Behold, I'm with you always, mm -hmm. even to the end of the age. Amen. When I was 14, I'd give you a little bit of my background so that you just know about me. I think sometimes there's, there's assumptions made about people in my position. I'm privileged to hold a very high position at one of the most prestigious universities in the world. And I'm just like you. Mm -hmm. When I was 11, my older sister was killed in a boating accident. She was 17. Mm -hmm. We weren't very uh, wealthy or anything on that, but our next door neighbor, uh, her, my, my sister's best friend, my sister was 17. And in Alabama, we tend to get married a little young. So, uh, so she was, her best friend was engaged at 17. And they were, uh, his, his friend had a boat and so they were going boating for a day. And my sister, they had an accident. She fell the boat. And won't go into details, but anyway, it took her life. It was gut wrenching. Less than a year after that, my parents went through a divorce. My grandmother died of cancer. I remember the cancer ate through her spine. She was paralyzed and she couldn't recognize me. Here I'm at the formative years of puberty. And I'm experiencing all these emotions. My brain is forming in, in unique ways. By the way, when you go to that age stage of life between like, Nine and fourteen is where, however puberty hits different people. Your brain forms like there's this studies about what the brain does and how it shifts neurological function for it to develop into a adulthood. And it messed me up. At fourteen, we started moving around. I forget how many places I've lived for at least a month at a time from the time I was born until I got out of the military. Like it was a lot. We started moving around, and, and at 14, when we started moving around, I lived at this one place though for for about six years, and now we start moving. I went to five different high schools, and I noticed these friends I had from where I lived for six years. Within months of leaving, we just grew distant. Now you're just not as close as you used to be because you're not around. Anymore. Some of us in this room are we're not feeling the closeness to God. And it's not because Jesus has left us or he's moved away or that relationship isn't accessible to us like it is for me when I moved around. It's because we haven't joined with him in his mission. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the promises of God. I am with you. Maybe the reason we're not experiencing the presence of God is we're so busy thinking about our problems instead of our mission mm -hmm. that we're depriving ourselves of experiencing the closeness of a wonderful Savior whose promise is I will be with you in what? In carrying out my mission. Mm -hmm. Not in sulking in your home while you eat your bag of potato chips and eat your ice cream. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, <laughs> and can I share something with you? No one is exempt from the brokenness of this world. Nobody. Some are just better at hiding it than others. Mm -hmm. I teach my kids all the time. I say there's a reason millionaires come to your mom and dad for advice. Mm -hmm. There's a reason Successful people come to your mom and dad for advice. We do a lot of ministry in our home, and people will leave, and they are some of the most well dressed, put together people. And I look at my kids and I go, Follow Jesus. No one's exempt. I tell my kids today, I said, Look at who we celebrate as the pinnacle of success artists, celebrities, movie stars, rappers, pop stars, all these people. And yet, how many of them are drug addicts and alcoholics? Yep, yeah, that's right. Their life's so good, they have to drown mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. to cope. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one is exempt from the brokenness of this world. No I had a friend of mine, he did a lot of inner city ministry, and I was struggling one day, and he said, if you want to deal with your pain in life, then help other people deal with their pain in life, and you're going to find great healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
maybe we're not experiencing the intimacy we want with Jesus because we haven't joined with him in his mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What will disciple making look like for you individually beyond the church gathering? You're called to make disciples beyond this moment. David can only do so much. I mean, he's good, <laughs> but there's a limit <laughs> to what he can do. And he can't do for you what God has called of you. That's right. Let me say that again. He can't do for you what God has called of you. Amen. Amen. How will you allow this command to direct your life? What if families committed to moving into particular areas of town to reach people and renovate it with the gospel? What if people ran for political office? All right, we could use some good Bible believing politicians in this area. Yes. What if instead of, of locking ourselves in our neighborhood and putting bars in the windows, which is appropriate at times, I mean, we, we, we've lived there. What if we went to the drug dealer's house and we said, hey man, we just want to talk to you about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't know what God is calling you to do. Maybe you have kids that live in your neighborhood and don't, don't be that, that older person. I remember being a kid one time and we had a ball. We were playing football on the street. I was far from God. And the ball rolled in somebody's yard and I just stepped in the yard to get it and I got yelled at by a man. So now I wasn't there for Jesus, so I later went and bought some salt and took care of his yard for him. But that was but before Jesus had gotten a hold of my life. Okay? We took care of that problem for him. But I, God has given me the resources that he has to be used. Amen. Maybe when our grandkids are playing in our house and they throw a ball and puts a hole in the sheetrock and they get upset, we are thankful that he's given us the gift of life and we can help teach them how God wants to harness that energy for his glory. Amen. Amen. Meaning, what if we just approach life with a different perspective? And so when those kids are playing ball in the front yard, maybe, maybe we buy a goal. Maybe we're retired and we buy a goal and put it up in front of our yard and we'll say, we'll pull it off the street and put it in our fence. And we'll pull it back out for you every day. If you want to play ball, you can play ball right here. I'll keep sure. it safe. Yes, mm -hmm. I'll buy little cones and put them there. The only thing I ask is that once in a while you let me uh, pour you a little glass of water and tell you about Jesus. And that has yeah. changed my life. Mm -hmm. I just think if we approached life a little differently, maybe we too could be an unlikely hero to somebody. And guess what? He pulled two people out. That's it. A lot of people will die that day. Yeah. You can't save everyone. But guess what? So you, save you can save someone. Yep. Yeah. And here's the other thing. You're not responsible for the results. Amen. You're just Amen. responsible to be obedient. Amen. 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 Guess what? You can love all those kids all day long and never see the fruit of your labor. And I think sometimes that's God's design to keep you from being proud. Mm -hmm. okay. Some of the women that changed my life were older women who were in their 70s and 80s who just committed to pray for me and they just showed me love as a little boy. Mm -hmm. And they died well before they ever saw the fruit of my life. There's a lot of wording on here. Mm -hmm. As people, we are sent out on a search and rescue mission. We must be careful not to look around for someone else to jump into the water, climb the mountain, burn the, uh, storm the burning building, or do whatever it takes to rescue others. We must be careful not to wait, but to prayerfully seek how God wants to use each of us individually in his mission to make disciples as we collectively meet together. The church has been given a charge, make disciples. This is what we are committed to, and, and that involves bringing people to Christ and maturing them in Christ. We must never lose sight of these two central concepts. We are about providing a way for believers to grow deep in Christ for the explicit purpose of going into the world to reach others for Christ while living for Christ. That's God's grand plan from the beginning. It's that his people compelled by his spirit will go forth into all creation to make disciples of every nation. Amen. In other words, you are a critical component of God's grand plan. You can make a difference. You can change a destiny. And you can impact the world. Mm -hmm. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that you would just continue to compel upon us, not with just mere sensationalism. It's too easy for me to tell catchy stories and come up with pithy sayings and to stir us up into an emotional rise simply to leave here unchanged. God, this is about us diving deeply into your word and becoming compelled by your spirit that we are called and we are equipped for a specific mission. God, I pray that all of us collectively would be compelled to be more faithful to make disciples while we too are seeking to be a disciple or a disciple ourselves. All for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.